issue the stage. Yeah. Turning to Ezra and chapter 9. Ezra, chapter 9. And we see here in this chapter that the people have sinned against God. We've had the combination service where we hear about God's wrath at sin. And we see here Ezra's despair, but his prayer towards the Lord. Let's, let's pray and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, we beseech thee as we have done in our prayers to be merciful to us sinners. Lord, there are many ways in which we've fallen short and it, maybe no, no one or two things in particular, but we are supposed to live fully to thy glory and to love thee and to love our neighbours as ourselves. And we know, Lord, that we fall very short of this and we pray for thy assistance from heaven. We pray to help us in the teaching from the Bible now in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The uh, book of Ezra has seen the people of God being sent back from captivity that they were in in Babylon and Persia and back to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem. And they were given a special help from the king the emperor, as you were, to set up again the uh, building of the temple, which was what we would call today the church, and to be able to come and worship God again and have their own land. And um, after some years, this was followed up by a man called Ezra, who is the author of this book, Ezra. And he went back as well and again was able to carry on the work and to get the uh, work of worship uh, truly established. Now he didn't know everything that was going on and it's the same in the church today. As a minister I don't know everything that you all are doing but sometimes we might hear things and we've got to be careful we don't just believe in rumours and things but the people of God are obviously meant to live thankful for God as they were to be brought back to a true worship of God they've come like we have through the Lord Jesus Christ to worship the living God and so therefore we're meant to keep God's um, commandments <clears throat> now of course the keeping of God's commandments doesn't save anybody we're saved by the work of Christ his sacrifice for our sins that's what saves we can't as it were add to that um, at all, but we are to live out of thankfulness to Jesus Christ, to live a godly life. That should be our, our, our purpose in life. And God is still angry with his people in all of their sin. So we come day by day, week by week, we come confessing our sins to God. And we remember again, as we did in the communion service this morning, the, the blood of Christ that was shed, that he gave himself for his people and we come confessing our sins and repentant of our sins and we know that God is continually forgiving us for our sins. But, um, sometimes there are particular things that need some attention and uh, he speaks here to the whole people of God who come together and it turns out that the, this is some time after they've come back and he gets a visit from the priests, from the some of the princes, not all of them, because some of them were guilty. And the there's been a great, you could say it's been a misunderstanding. People don't understand. They don't know what they're to be taught. But they've gone astray, as we're all prone to do. And what has happened, the sin is mentioned in the first verse, is that they have not 
separated themselves from the people of the land. Now, that may sound a difficult thing to understand, um, but what they've done is they've taken, verse 2, of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. Uh, so they, the holy seed have they have mingled themselves with the people of those lands, yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. So this is the uh, a real disaster. It may not sound anything to us. We there are people come, for example, from all different countries, and if they're Christians, they they can marry each other. There's nothing wrong in that. That's not what's being addressed here. It isn't a racial thing as such. <clears throat> but the the problem is is that the people who were supposed to be worshipping the true God have joined together in marriage with people who don't love God at all. And if any of you will know it's hard enough to worship God ourselves. But if you're joined together in marriage with someone who really hates God, they've got no then you're really going to put yourself in a terrible mess. Mm -hmm. And the poor little children are going to be brought up very confused. Absolutely. Now, there are cases where people get married and they're not Christians. And the one becomes a Christian and the other doesn't, sadly. And this does happen. And it's a very difficult situation. But in those cases, the husband or the wife, whichever has become a Christian, is to stay. Uh, to stay with the other person even though they haven't become a Christian and that's a great uh, it, that can be a, quite a challenge for people but nevertheless they're married in the eyes of God and they stay married together but and there's very few uh, exceptions uh, to that now the problem is here is that then this these people have been brought back to Jerusalem with the purpose of coming to worship God, to be the people of God. They are the great people from whom Jesus Christ is going to come. So it's extremely important. Even, it's even more important. But it's as equally as important for us. And so these, they have really done something. They've gone really against God here. They've been very rebellious. And this is to be emphasised today for Christians who make the same mistake. It's, it's, it's not just a mistake, it's a very serious thing if a Christian forms a marriage with a non-Christian. Now, in the eyes of the world, they think it's lovely. They think, oh, what good, there's peace between the different religions. But the Christian life is committed to serving God wholeheartedly. And as we've said, the husband and the wife are joined together in their marriage with one purpose. And so it's very, very, um, very uh, demoralising, as it were, for the church. It puts, it sends people away, and it turns their hearts away from God. And just very briefly to go through some explanation of that before we see how um, how Ezra responds to this situation. Of course, we've got all sorts of strange things happening today in marriages, or well, thank you, not among. Christians uh, we trust but in Deuteronomy chapter 7 it's going right back to the Old Testament but these principles here are well set out Deuteronomy chapter 7 it says when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it and hast cast out many nations before thee uh, these ones which are named here actually they were mightier and greater than thou and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them well obviously that bit doesn't apply uh, to us thou shalt make no covenant with them nor show mercy unto them neither shalt thou make marriages with them thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they, and this is the reason it's given here, for they will turn away thy son from following me, and they, that they may serve 
other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Well, obviously, we're not going into, a, we're going into a land ultimately, into heaven, and there won't be any non-Christians there, of course. But in the meantime, this principle of marriage is that if somebody marries someone that's not a Christian, the other person will turn them away from following the Lord. And they'll serve other gods, and the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. There's a very solemn warning. And we would make that very clear to any Christian, particularly young people, people we know. You may know people that are considering marrying someone who's not a Christian, and you would warn them very strongly that if they think that it works the other way around. Well, I've got some quotes on this in just a moment, actually. Um, that they are really playing with fire. James chapter 4 and 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't love our enemies, but we do recognise them as enemies, and we don't, as it were, have... Well, there, there may be a time... Yeah, there, there's a kindness towards other people that we may call acquaintance or something like that. And that's uh, because we're acquainted with people, we're, we're friendly to them, but not a, a true uh, friendship. I mean, some people say, well, I've got some friends that aren't Christians, and they may, they may have up to a point. But the real friendship of the world is speaking of uh, friendship with that whole ungodly system. We're really getting drawn into a close relationship with going on on the things that are separate from God and, uh, and, and nothing to do with it. Of course, in our work, we're involved in the world. There are, there, there, there are these t type of things, but we must recognise there is a real danger that the heart where the heart is involved, that there is a love for the things of the world and the friendship of this world that is really standing opposed to Jesus Christ. We can be impressed by some of the things of the world, but we're to be very, very wary. This probably sounds today quite extreme, but it's traditional, old Christian teaching and was well understood by Christians for many centuries past. Yes. And it should be today. Huh? Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah, it should be quite common sense. And uh, Matthew chapter 6, just a, a few more references, and we go to some, some other examples. Matthew 6 and verse 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon and uh, sometimes we don't realize that we're getting attracted to the things of the world but sometimes when we lose them that's that's the test did it really bother us or can we say that's fine if we if uh, if we've been burgled or something does it really 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 trouble us and keep on nagging at us or can we say, well, that's things of the world. The things of Christ are what I really care about. That's solid. That's just one kind of test. When we're held back from normal worldly things, uh, does it really bother us? Or can we say, well, no, that's secondary. And it's a thing of the world, and I'm not going to love it too much. I'm going to guard my heart carefully. Legitimate and good things. Maybe we, we go out to... A, a restaurant for something to eat and it's closed. Are we really, really upset? Or do we just say, no, it's only food, doesn't matter, I'm going home. Praise the Lord that I'm safe. Is that our attitude? And there's a countless other things uh, uh, like that. Do we love money or do we love God? There we are. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you see, 
I think one of the things people don't often think about is when they become a Christian, something very dramatic has happened. It, we've been we've been going our whole way through our lives, and then Second uh, Corinthians chapter six, then we've been we've been as it were taken, haven't we, by Jesus Christ, who's died for our sins and is our saviour and who loves us and so our heart returns thanks and praise unto God and so the ungodly world that flitters and flaunts in all sorts of things and it's so vain it's so proud it's so uh, ridiculous and stupid if I can use such words uh, the, the Christian gets rather fed up of a lot of this stuff not that we'll be unkind to people they don't know any different but our hearts are, are taken. So it says in Second Corinthians chapter 6, and this would, would apply this mostly, uh, uh, very much to marriage. See, if you marriage is someone and they're all concerned about their house and their wealth and their prospects and their retirement, and this is their great concern, the Christian will find it very, very hard when our hearts are the spiritual things. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? We are shocked at how, how Muslims like to be separate from people, but they're actually, if it was a true religion that they had, of course it would be right. Um, 1 John chapter 2 again and 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 to 17 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world although it's made by God interestingly all that's in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. It's very different. And I say, it's often when things are taken away from us that we're really tested and we really find out, because we have to use the things of the world. The Bible is quite clear that there's nothing wrong with anything in the world, that we eat things, we, we, we do things, as long as they're not sinful things. But it's where our heart is really settled. Where is our contentment? Is it from having this and that in the world? Or is it from God through Jesus Christ? That's the question. And being a person that belongs to God, that's the great thing the Christian has. So here, the people of, in the time of Ezra have, have forsaken God. And they, they have... Uh, they don't realise that they have to begin with they think that they may be making some practical arrangement for peace Let's, but if we marry them and they marry us then we'll all be getting on well and it'll all be very good and it'll work out well but they've forgotten that the other people are not worshippers of God so they're going to draw their hearts away for the things of the world for false gods and that is uh, it's going to ruin the whole of the church it would ruin the whole church today if everybody here their heart was drawn after someone who was an unbeliever, it would ruin our whole church, it would fall apart completely. And that is what happens today in, in uh, as much, and often sadly, by people being extremely selfish and careless in this matter, impatient with God in his provision. Um, a couple of warnings, one from the 17th century, Richard Baxter wrote, it is true that God is able to convert them when he will. This is one of the excuses. Oh, I, I've, I've, I've just met so-and-so, and if I, if I marry them, I'm sure God will convert them. And Richard Baxter says, well, it's true that God could. It may be done, but what of that? Excuse me. It says, will you, in so weighty a case of marriage, a very serious thing, take up with a mere possibility God can make a beggar rich and for all you know to the contrary he will do it and yet you will not therefore marry a beggar nor will you marry a leper 
Sorry, some of us might be feeling like we're lepers. Because God, because God can heal a leper, but you wouldn't marry him and say, well, I think I'm going to marry him because God's going to heal him. Why then should you marry an ungodly person? Because God can convert him. I thought that was a very good... Um, even more chilling a warning comes from an example given in the Dictionary of Illustration. It says... This is, this is, are you ready for this? A consistent Christian young man became attached to a pleasure loving, uh, they put the word gay because that's what they would say, you see, people who were frivolous, young lady, pleasure loving lady. He was a serious Christian, he met this girl, she's very pretty, no doubt, but just was interested in. The true story, yeah? Uh, um, I don't know, I don't know. I, th I think it was, it, it could be. He married her against the advice of his brethren. Her influence silenced his prayers, estranged him from the house of God, and led him to her ways of pleasure. Sickness called his attention back to religion. When he became sick, he realised that there was something very serious was going on. Twice his wife had dri driven him from his duty. Now in agony and remorse, with a fearful eternity before him, he gazed upon her and cried, Rebecca, Rebecca, you are the cause of my eternal damnation. And he died. Could you imagine that? I, 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 the, the, this is seriously what happens to people. Obviously, you could say, well, they weren't true Christians in the first place. That's all well and good. But it's a serious warning of what the terrible state. It happened very nearly to Solomon, as you know. He had many, many wives in the Old Testament. From Not that they were foreign, exactly. That wasn't, the problem truly wasn't that they were foreign, but they were worshipping foreign gods. This is the very important distinction. It's not... A, racial problem. We can say that about Britain today. If people come from and they want to come and worship the true God, we have blessing coming to our land. If we preach the gospel to people that come to the land, we have blessing coming to the land. And, well, we know that the church is, again, it's separate from the whole world, so we have a slightly different um, situation as well. We, we aren't really talking... In Ezra, it was the whole nation who was at stake. Whereas today, it's the church that's at stake. So the, uh, the church is, is warned about going down the worldly ways. The um, marrying unbelievers, for example, is one very destructive uh, course that the church can take. But it, uh, following all, all the ways of, of the world and letting down the standards that God has set up. Well, Ezra's reaction, we come uh, briefly to, uh, to, to, to see what happens next. He reacts when he heard of this, this was happening, to people that had known so much of God's blessing, they'd been brought back to Jerusalem, and they had a, the temple being set up again for the true worship of God, but their hearts had to be for God. And you can't, see the hearts of other people but when you start hearing about things happening then you start to be concerned and he was very concerned and he reacted in a in a stronger way than perhaps anyone has in the bible reacted towards sin among the people of god when he heard this thing he said i rent my garment and my mantle so two layers of clothing and he actually plucked off the hair of his head and of his beard and sat down it says astonished, absolutely astonished. And he it, it actually, it, sometimes there's a sign of, uh, of uh, a strong remorse. People would shave off their hair. But he actually, uh, don't try this, he actually pulled his hair out and the hair of his beard, he pulled it out. So it's very painful to think about, isn't it? But this was his reaction to how furious he was, how angry and in fact how angry God was 
of what the people of God were doing. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. People knew the seriousness of the state that the people had fallen into so soon after great blessing. And uh, we may be aware of this, sometimes God greatly blesses us. And our hearts, they're so, they're so fickle, they're so light that we take off and we must walk humbly before God, be very wary of sudden enthusiasm to run in one direction or another, lest we fall into, into great sins. But here, the people that tremble at the words of God because of the transgressions of those that have been carried away, they sat there until the evening and they sat there together with great... He arose from his heaviness, verse 5, and fell upon his knees and spread out his hands unto the Lord. And so there's a time for repentance. And he says that he was ashamed to God to lift up his face, verse 6, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up upon unto the heavens and here he's not speaking just of he's not speaking really of himself he hasn't done this sin but he feels it for the whole people of God when the people of God start going astray Ezra speaks on behalf of them all although he is not the one who is involved in this sin and so he has this great reaction this extreme despair and crying and calling on God. And this is what 2 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about as a godly sorrow here. There's uh, uh, chapter 7 verse 10. Yes, okay. have, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. It, it, it's good to be affected in such a way as this and to to come to God for behold uh, it speaks of Paul speaks of those that sorrowed after a godly sort and so it, it's important when there's a true sorrow that we turn to God and not to despair well this is how he how he reacts and um, I worry about going on too long. He, 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 he prays then uh, to God at, at some length here, uh, confessing the sins of the people and acknowledging that God, God has been graceful to them. For a little space grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. It was only some of them that had escaped in the first place. They were quite a small group relatively to begin with anyway. And they were given a nail in his holy place that our God might lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. It was just when God was reviving them, when he brought them back, when he blessed them out of their bondage and extended mercy unto us to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God. And you often hear today of churches being established, small churches, and they grow and God is blessing them and reviving them and yet it's very important that people walk humbly before God we, we read in the last two chapters how the hand of the Lord God had been upon them and that was very wonderful wasn't it to know that they could be taken on that journey through a dangerous country back to Jerusalem back to the true worship of God and the hand of the Lord was upon him. He was ashamed to ask for soldiers to help them on the way. And the hand of God was upon them. But here, well, we, we've just got to be thankful that Ezra brought this to their attention. He, he, he brings them out to prayer. We'll see how he goes on on a further occasion in the next chapter. But in his, in his prayer he gives a great deal of thanks to God and he confesses that the people have forsaken the commandments of God. What well, we read in the combination there, much of the curses that are upon people of God for sin 
and we all need to examine ourselves. We, we don't get reports of everyone's uh, sins, and yet we're all to confess our sins to God. <coughs> and so this, this particular warning in, in this in this particular chapter is of one particular sin, that of going after the world and joining together with the world. And I've said, it doesn't mean that we're unfriendly towards people. It certainly doesn't mean that we're unkind towards people. But it, it does mean that we must watch our hearts, that what our real concern is, is for the glory of God and the worship of God and that we know that what we really have that is the thing that we really uh, care about and are thankful for is God's salvation in Jesus Christ. That, should, that, that does set us apart from the world. The world doesn't recognise Christ. It doesn't recognise the need for salvation. It doesn't give thank God thanks for saving us from our sins. And so the heart of the world is completely different. Now, of course, we want to go out into the world. We want to talk to people and try and, we're using the word persuasion, try and persuade them to come over, to come out themselves, out of the world, and come uh, to God and to come through Jesus Christ and believe in the one that was crucified and that it wasn't just a, an old story, but it was. It is the truth yeah, that God gave Jesus Christ to be the Saviour. And without Him, people are living in rebellion to their Creator. So we have got a lot to get involved with the world. But our greatest purpose in it is to be telling them of Jesus Christ. Now we've got to go on every day. And I say we've got work and we're involved with people on a day-to-day -day basis. But be careful, be very wary of our hearts and certainly this business of marriage is a very serious one and Christians need if we're to be married to have godly husbands and wives and godly uh, godly marriages just a couple more texts before we uh, conclude Hebrews chapter 9 and verse uh, 26 Hebrews 9 and verse 26 Says, when we come, we may be concerned about ourselves, and we may realise that we are not really as committed to following Jesus Christ as we should be. Not that we've gone and married an unbeliever or something like that, but in other ways, our hearts have been taken up too much for the things of the world. I know we've got our concerns, there's things we've got to do, but we are convinced here in Hebrews 9, it says, now once, in the middle of this verse, in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There's this one offering of sin, of Jesus Christ. And the Christian that's erred, the Christian that's sinned, but like hopefully these people we're going to read about in Ezra, they return to the Lord. They take notice. Often today, if it's sort of something is sinful, people just make excuses for themselves. They're not really very interested in knowing what God says is right and wrong. They make up their mind and then they just spout out excuses without really engaging properly with what the Bible says. And we must be very careful that we're not like that. And we must, uh, we must be assured that there is this sacrifice for sin in Jesus Christ. As we were saying this morning, our, our tendency would, to, would be to say, depart from me, if we did get anywhere near to dealing with things, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It, we don't want to consider these things. But in fact, the, the, the blessing, the real blessing comes when we come to Jesus Christ as sinners, we put our whole trust in his death upon the cross, we confess our sins to God, and we're cleansed and washed from our sins, and we stand before God justified in his sight. This is the real 
But this is the treasure, isn't it, of the church that's in Christ, the hidden treasures that are in Christ. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what we need. That's how the church should be living, with a keeping a short account with God. Come back to him quickly. We all sin. If we say we have not sinned, we make him alive and his word is not in us. Next verse. We, we have all sinned, but we return to God with repentance and we're refreshed, renewed and revived. And this reviving that has started when we've come to Christ is to be kindled and becomes a great flame that burns in the heart. And there's the, the, the world, you see, is a great enemy of it. The, the world will dampen this fire, this fire of glorying in Jesus Christ. It'll dampen it. There was another... I found some good little stories this time, but I don't often find them. Alexander the Great, you've heard of him. He was the one, he was the world conqueror a, a, a few hundred years before Christ came. It was reported, Alexander the Great was a very great leader, and it was reported to him that a soldier um, had betrayed great coward, cowardice, cowardice on a particular occasion. And Alexander called him to ask and asked him his name. On hearing that his name was Alexander, the soldier that had betrayed cowardice, had been, had been cowardly, his name was Alexander as well. And Alexander the Great upbraided this man with the dishonour that he brought on such a name and entreated him either to change his manners or to change his name, asking him how he could dare, while known as Alexander, act so unworthily. We could say that that would apply to a Christian. We're called Christians because we're people that have turned to Jesus Christ and we carry his spirit. He's come to us and how we should not display cowardice or any kind of thing that would bring the name of Christ into disrepute. We are rather, we know we do let the Lord down, we're to repent of our sins and we're to live to his honour and glory. Well, I was going to ask three questions that you can maybe take home with you. How can we maintain a good spiritual state that we don't fall away like the people did here in the time of Ezra. Obviously, we you know, don't marry an unbeliever is one thing, but how can we maintain a spiritual state, a good, healthy spiritual state? Reading our Bible every day? Praying to God? Drawing near to the Lord? Coming to services together? Hearing the preaching? Various things we can do. Reading good Christian books? Being wary, examining ourselves, checking that we're not really going after things. Than what's what's been before, huh? It's in the world. Than what's yeah. Before. Well, it's always been worldly. The world's always been worldly and loved itself. But things aren't so bad then. Well, it, maybe it's easier for us to see if the world's worse. Then it makes it easier for us because it's easier to distinguish, isn't it? When the world's semi-godly, you can go along with it. But when it's very ungodly, then we've got to be very careful. When and when our spiritual state is backslidden in a way, uh, what do we do then? How can we regain this ground, this precious ground, this precious resting place in Christ? Well, we talked about repentance, prayer, as Ezra did, confessing the sin that we're all the whole church, as it were, is caught up in from time to time, and let us seek the Lord sincerely that he may give us great grace to keep his commandments, chiefly to love him, to be very thankful. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, thou art righteous and yet gracious. We're before thee in our 
trespasses and we cannot stand before thee because of this as Ezra himself prayed the conclusion of that chapter should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations wouldst thou not be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so there should be no remnant nor escaping. Lord, thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such deliverance. O oh Lord, we pray, forgive us all our sins, and grant thy people thy Holy Spirit, that we may live to thy glory, that we may follow thy way, Lord, keep us from the love of the world and the things of the world which are enmity with God. Help us, Lord, to be able to spot these sort of things. Help us to be able to spot the tricks even of our own hearts that would lead us astray. Help us, Lord, to be devoted to our Saviour and to his cause and to his people as we seek to be salt and light in this world until the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank thee that Ezra was really broken and concerned by the sin of the Old Testament church. And Lord, help us to be truly concerned today of the sins in our own church and in the church at large. And Lord, where there's been much going astray, and Lord, we pray thou would strengthen thy people, bless thy people, Lord, cause them to know and love thee. Help us to understand the Bible more fully and to serve thee with gladness until the Lord Jesus Christ comes, which we pray, Lord, maybe, maybe soon, Lord. Grant thy people sustaining power from heaven. Pour out thy Spirit upon us that we may love the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.